All right. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're logging in from today. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Um, thank you for taking your time out of your, your busy day. Um, my name is Marcy Reedy. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on supporting open science and the promotion and tenure process. Uh, lessons from the University of Maryland. Um, I'm a community manager here at the Center for Open Science, looking to promote um, reproducible and transparent research practices among the education um, community and to um, expand um, the knowledge and know-how um, of the open science disciplines. And before we started, I did just want to share with everyone one quick link um, that will hopefully be of use um, to you as you, you move forward. Um, and that is to a knowledge hub that we have developed on the OER Commons webpage. Um, we are referring to it or call it the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base. And it is the place for you to go um, to understand the who, what, and how of open science. Whether you're a student that is looking to expand your open and transparent research practices or a mentor that is looking for material that you can use to support um, a very able and energized graduate student. Um, so I wanted to, to share that, that with you. Um, we'll have resources um, also supporting our discussion today. And then um, without further ado, um, we wanted to move forward because we have a um, very exciting um, discussion planned. Um, for the webinar today. And I do use the word discussion um, very deliberately. Um, so we were, were talking earlier, we just wanted to, um, to take this moment to encourage everyone um, to feel free to set aside some formality standards and feel free to enter questions in the chat function as the webinar proceeds. We really encourage engagement and, and discussion and you know, hope to make this as tailored um, to your interest as possible. Um, so, so please don't hesitate to speak up and um, also share your experiences and your stories um, if you feel comfortable doing so. So it is next my great pleasure um, to be able to introduce and welcome um, Dr. Michael Daughtry, the department chair at the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland. Um, one of the intros, or as we were preparing um, for this webinar, we were kind of doing some crowdsourcing on Twitter, um, the social media on who is doing interesting things around the promotion and tenure process. And um, Dr. Daltrey's name came up repeatedly. So we're so pleased that, that he could be there. And um, um, one line, and I'm just going to quote from your, your bio online, if you don't mind, but one line that really stood out to me um, that I absolutely loved is when he says that, um, um, that um, the view of a mentor that, that you had and one that has carried on, that you've carried on, was that the process of doing science is more important than the results one obtains. Um, and so I thought that was just a really interesting context and important um, framing method of what we're, we're trying to, to think about as, as we move forward. So um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a really great opportunity to share, you know, some of the things we've done here at the University of Maryland, uh, maybe uh, impart some uh, lessons learned for the rest of the community who is interested in really promoting and uh, uh, advocating, but also moving beyond just advocating for open science, but actually doing the hard work to make this happen at your institution. And I hope I can provide some help. At the end of this webinar, um, Marcy's going to put up a link to a, a Google form that allow you to, to uh, reach out to me. And I'm happy to work with anybody, any groups, any individuals, any departments who who just you know want to explore what they need to do in their department. So we'll have that survey put up here at the end. So uh, Marcy mentioned my bio online, and there, there's another part that I really love about uh, um, my prior mentor. And uh, I remember early on in my graduate career, uh, we were talking about research and, and some research projects we were getting ready to la launch. And he looked over his glasses and just said, Mike, we just need to be fair to science. And the sort of this mantra of we have to be fair to science uh, has stuck with me 
uh, my entire career. And I frequently return to that principle of, you know, science is a process, but we have to respect that process. We have to be fair to the process because ultimately our goal is to understand fundamental laws of nature. And we can only do that if we're fair to nature and we're fair to science. And so uh, uh, that has stuck with me. And it's a principle, I think, that also is embedded and underpins the open science movement. And uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, the Center for Open Science, uh, Brian Nozick, and all of his leadership that he has, has uh, put into this over the years to really bring this, this uh, focus, uh, 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 I think, to the center point of, of academia and to help those of us like myself really move this process forward. Bec without that, that leadership, uh, we would not be in the place we are right now where we can start to talk about policies, the policies that allow us to codify what it means to be fair to science, okay? And not only that, fair to our community partners, our funders, uh, our taxpayers that make all this work possible. So I hope to move everybody from that point of I'm an advocate for soap open science and I want this to happen to now I'm going to do something about that. And uh, so we're going to maybe hopefully get you to that point of being an activist by the end here. Okay, that's my opening. Here, here. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, one of the mantras um, we have at, at the Center for Open Science is make it possible um, for open science practices, um, make it normative um, so that it is appearing everywhere among all your peers, and then implement it into policy. So exactly, um, you know, as we move along, that's that's very true. And one of the things getting to the promotion and tenure process um, that is so critical about that is that if you don't line, align the incentive structures um, for the promotion and tenure process, um, you're never gonna see it widely adopted. So. Um, the structure for today, um, we have generated um, through a brainstorming process, a series of questions that we had um, about the journey um, that the University of Maryland Psychology Department went on in developing new guidelines, um, promoting open science and their promotion and tenure. Um, and so we're going to take the liberty of answering the questions as we move forward. Um, but should you have questions um, that we don't address, um, please please raise them. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll move right forward. Um, and the first question um, that, that we have or was hoping to get some, some input um, from you on was, um, what gaps did you notice in the PNT process um, before you made your changes? And what motivated you to create and adopt these new guidelines? Well, um, when I started this process, Marcy, um, there was a, uh, we were long overdue for a revision of our criteria. Uh, our criteria were last revised in 2006, and probably they reflected the historical uh, perspective even before that, right? So I, I'm guessing that the revision in 2006 really was very similar to what they look like prior to 2006. So they were long overview, and we are sort of at this point in time where they we had to, by university guidelines, uh, revise them. Um, so the biggest gap was is that they were Embarrassing, embarrassingly incomplete and outdated. And by that, I mean, they really relied on a lot of, of uh, sort of historical views of what it means to, to evaluate research. And when we talk about evaluating research, the question oftentimes is, are we evaluating the reputation of someone or are we evaluating the substance of one's work? And what I think most of us will probably realize is that a lot of the metrics that we kind of rely on really go back to that notion of reputation, right? And then we have to ask what drives a reputation? And oftentimes it's things that are completely unrelated to the science one is doing. Uh, in fact, uh, completely out of the control of the, of the scientist, uh, what sort of reputation you have. Now, of course, you can get good reputations from you know, doing good science, bad reputation for doing bad science. But my guess is that there's a pretty uh, bad correlation between the science and the reputation. Um, and in fact, you can get bad reputation quite easily, uh, as we now know. Um, so, yeah, um, so that said, revising our professional or our promotion tenure criteria was was really a priority of mine when I came on as chair in um, what was it, uh, 2017. I, it was one of the things that I spoke with my department about when I was quote unquote interviewing for the chair position, um, and. 
uh, much of what I was focused on at that time was uh, issues surrounding responsible conduct of research and re reproducibility. And because, you know, the, where the, who are the gatekeepers of this? Um, the, presumably, there's some gatekeeping that happens at the journals, at the review stage, but we know that those are really imperfect uh, 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 gatekeepers. And we also know that um, uh, the reputation factors uh, can drive whether someone gets published or not, depending on, you know, who you are, what your name is, where you got your degree from. And so, uh, uh, you know, the more I got into this, uh, I started actually gravitating towards sort of a more moral perspective on why we need to do open science, um, uh, such as, you know, as a public institution here at the University of Maryland, uh, or even just, a, you know, an institution of higher education, our mandate really is to serve the pub public. And specifically, we do our work for the betterment of society. Um, and it's really just difficult to see how our work benefits anybody other than ourselves if it's not made maximally accessible. Um, so if our work is locked behind a paywall or our data is under lock and key, it limits its impact. By definition, if something cannot be viewed by others, it's going to have limited impact. If it's not accessible by the community, it's going to have limited impact. And so the goal here is really, what can we do to make that impact broader, make our accessible, make our work much, uh, much more accessible to the public um, so that we can have a bigger impact on science. And we can think about this not just as impact of science, but uh, uh, sort of a more general principle, which I call uh, impact as access. Uh, so access uh, is a necessary requirement for impact. Uh, you can have impact uh, in many different ways, and it could be through scholarship, uh, and it could be also through you know, who you serve, right? Who, what communities is your work geared towards and serving? How do we serve our community as scientists and administrators? Um, you know, what do we do in the, in the life course of our work to make our community of scientists uh, more inclusive? And so those are all issues about accessibility, accessibility of research and accessibility of people to the research enterprise. So this idea of impact as access, I think, underpins uh, almost everything that we've done in our promotion and tenure policy. Uh, and I think allows it to have a much broader impact as it's realized in terms of faculty um, uh, work products and research. Yeah, I, I love the, the discussion of framing it not only practically with the impact and accessibility, uh, but also from a morality frame of um, this is the right thing to do for science. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so then the next question that follows, um, we've kind of framed the setting and a little bit of the, the problems um, that were um, that were experienced. Um, why did you feel that these guidelines were the um, were important? Why were were they the solution that that drew you to to this um, quest for greater impact and accessibility? Uh, well, well, there are, there are many reasons, um, really. Uh, first, I you know I really thought it was important that our faculty be evaluate on the substance of their work uh, and not, you know, just looking at indicators that boil down to reputation uh, or reputational criteria. So, you know, there, there are, a, I'm not going to go into all the, the research on this, but uh, if you, if you look at the work on bibliometric uh, indices, there, there are some serious questions about their validity. And I think uh, some, some research that would imply that they're actually either completely unrelated to the quality of the science, or in some cases, negatively related to the quality of the science, uh, depending on what aspects that you're looking at. And, and my guess is, is that those indices play an outsized role in the evaluation of uh, scientists. Now, uh, if, if you're a uh, um, industrial organizational psychologist or in human resources, you know that it's not actually not so cool to use indices or criteria for, for evaluating employees that uh, could create um, what's known as adverse impact, you know, impacting one subgroup more so than another subgroup. But there's some evidence that bibliometric 
indices hold the promise to actually have adverse impact on employees. And so, you know, there's some potentially, I've, I've never heard the legal arguments raised about these, but uh, when I started looking at this literature, I thought, oh God, you know, if the lawyers saw that these criteria that are in our promotion and tenure documents uh, have been shown to have manifested biases in, you know, uh, males versus females or um, uh, racial disparities in, you know, how those, those criteria manifest, uh, they would probably want us to take a very serious look at the inclusion of them in our documents or in our criteria. Right. Um, so, you know, returning to this idea of reputational criteria, really the goal was to move people away from those, those things that the candidates don't have control over to those things that the candidates do have control over. So, you know, you can't pick your, your reviewers for journal articles, right? And oftentimes it's the luck of the draw. Did you get people who are going to be sympathetic to your particular theory or viewpoint or open to new ways of thinking? Uh, those are things that, that can determine whether or not a paper is accepted in your preferred journal or not. Um, the other part of this is, is that, uh, you know, if you're doing work on problem X, where do you send that? Well, you can try for the maximal impact factor journal of uh, recognizing that it'll be a little bit out of place and probably won't be accepted. And so you kind of clog up the arteries of, of you know, that journal. Or you can send it to a, a journal that might be more uh, field specific, but would target the right audience. And so we wanted to give people the, the power to, to think about where is the most appropriate place to publish my work without them really sort of worrying about in the back of their mind is, is this going to count the same as X? Um, so if you're doing work that is important to particular communities, then it makes sense to be publishing in outlets where those communities are you know reading that work right or who are sort of monitoring those those outlets um a few i guess uh, the other things that and i don't want to sort of just uh, kind of drone on here but uh, we really wanted to make sure that faculty felt empowered to do science the way they felt like they needed to do science and this is both the questions they ask the populations they're addressing but also uh, and in, in particular for early career researchers uh, to be able to carry out the science in a way they felt maximized the integrity of the science, right? So people who were interested in or who um, uh, really felt that transparency, uh, openness, and accessibility were cornerstones of why they're doing their work. We wanted to make sure that they felt that they can continue to hold true to their own personal values and still do their work and have that work counted. Now, of course, we all know open science, uh, working with underserved populations or hard to reach populations can uh, come at a cost. It takes time and effort to do those things. And the faculty need to know that they're supported and they need to know that that work is valued and viewed as important. Um, and so when we set out to do these things, we were really trying to uh, in essence, add a layer of protection and reassurance to our younger faculty, many of whom are coming in with this idea that, you know, I'm doing science because I want to have an impact on my community, or I'm doing science because um, I really feel like, you know, I can have an impact on the scientific endeavor. And they have these sort of uh, worldviews about how that ought to be done. And then they get into the academy and we say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, that's great save that for when you have tenure. Tenure, Right now, just pump out a bunch of articles, uh, as many as you can, and don't worry about those things because it'll be detrimental to your career. You know, as a young faculty, even as a established faculty member, that's demoralizing to say, don't do it the way you want to do it because it won't be valued. Do it this other way, you know, and then knowing full well that that's not the best way to do it, feeling like you've been cornered. I mean, it's no wonder people want to get out of academia when they feel like they don't have the power uh, or the agency to do work the way they want to do it. So those were the sort of key components of, of why I feel like they're important um, and why we really pursued this uh, in my department. Fantastic. It sounds like really opening up and giving some freedom to the faculty um, 
to pursue the, their best choice. Yeah, we hope so. Okay. Pausing right here, just wanted to see if there were any um, comments, thoughts, questions from the audience before we continue to move forward. Um, feel free to, to chime in if you have any, um, um, any experiences or thoughts um, that you'd like to share. Um, so the next question, oh, Sandra has a raised hand. Um, feel free. Um, Sandra, did you wanna unmute and speak up? She may need uh, permission. I don't see, oh, is it Sandra? Let's see. Does she need a permission, like a uh, allow to talk? Um, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> we do, we do, uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I didn't actually mean to raise my head. I just, I was trying to type a chat message, but it said chat was disabled, but then I saw the Q and A. So that's where I can type. So now I know. Um, I do have a question um, because you mentioned how people may not want to uh, publish in the highest impacts, but not so suitable journal, uh, but maybe in a better su suitable journal that may have a lower impact factor. How do you end up evaluating that? Oh, well, you know, my attitude is, is that you evaluate the substance of the research. So, I mean, if what we're going to do is, is uh, say, well, I'm going to evaluate you based on your impact factor, that's, you know, as a someone who's supposed to be evaluating the research, I'm sort of pushing that off on some assumed process that went on at the journal level, of which could have had all sorts of things going on that determined whether or not that paper uh, was accepted for publication. So my view is, is that you focus on the substance of the research, not on the uh, outlet in which it is published. I see. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so another question that has come in that raises raises a good point um, is what about, what, are, what were the responses from faculty who had made impact through these publications? Um, so I'm assuming this is from the previous status quo you know, of, of, um, of researchers that were finding success um, within establishment journal articles. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but um, you know, what kind of reaction um, was there among those faculty? Yeah, yeah, I, I can maybe touch on this a little bit later when we talk about, uh, we have some other questions coming up here about uh, the pros and cons, uh, the obstacles. And um, uh, so, I mean, the bottom line is by the time we finished this process, everybody was on board. Uh, we had a unanimous uh, uh, agreement over the, the criteria. The people who I thought might be a little bit more uh, resistant to change had bought in. And it's, it's a process. So it's not like, you know, people looked at this and said, okay, I, have, I, I agree with these criteria. Let's move on. It actually took a good amount of time. I want to say four to five years uh, from the inception uh, to the point in which we had these done. And, you know, the question you raise here is, you know, the definition of impact. So are we measuring impact by citations? Well, for measuring impact by citations, that really puts citations on the left-hand side of the regression equation, as if that's the thing we're trying to predict. But I would argue that the citation part ends should be on, if we're going to use it, should be on the predictor side of the equation. It's an indicator of something not the criterion to be maximized. And I think that's a key thing to really keep in mind that we don't do science to maximize our citations. If we want to agree, if we believe that that's an indicator of impact, that's fine. Uh, of course, then we need to look at the research and say, well, is it a measure of impact? Uh, there's some questions there about whether or not it is, but certainly some, some articles are highly cited, some aren't. Um, and there's a whole literature on that. So I spent a fair amount of time talking about what we mean by impact, why we should be thinking about citations in a different way, and drawing on the data, the literature to show that, well, hey, look, you know, if we're going to think about citations like this, we'd be prepared for the fact that mm -hmm. um, there are gender biases, there are racial disparities. Um, and these are not good. These are not good properties of a predictor variable if we're using it to evaluate people. Mm -hmm have other forms, other measurements of impact. 
Yeah. To broaden. Yeah. Another question, um, real quick, we can um, go to this one before moving forward. Um, I think this is a great question about portability. Um, faculty that if they weren't staying at the University of Maryland, how would they? How would their um, UMD measurements be applicable at another institution? Um, and were there concerns expressed about that? Um, you know, I think the, the issue of portability may have come, may have come up once. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, if people are going to leave the university and go someplace else, or you know, they, they have to make those decisions themselves. Uh, I am a big proponent, though, of preparing your career in, in a way which makes you mobile. Um, you know, I think everybody from staff on up to faculty should really be prepared uh, to make themselves mobile. But, you know, the, the, the other thing here I think that is really relevant to think about is there will come a day, and I think probably now we're looking at this in terms of, you know, a few years, where these types of, of uh, policy changes will be required by virtue of federal policy. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the issue of portability here is probably going to go away. This is just a guess. Um, um, but, you know, that this is a legitimate concern that individual people will just have to grapple with. And, you know, ultimately, you have to make your case that I'm doing my work in a particular way that holds true to my values the values of my institutions, the value of, of my science, my discipline. Um, you know, when we sign up to be academics, we don't do it because we want to maximize our citations. At least I don't think so. We want to do it because we want to do good science. We want to impart some good on society. And in mind. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I see uh, uh, we have one more question there yeah. about leadership. Um yeah, we may want to hold, um, um, David Moore, this is a great question. Um, we have some focus coming up on forces supporting and resisting um, the implementation of the guidelines um, that this may pl play into. So um, maybe if you don't mind, we'll pause on that question and revisit it um, here in a moment. But that, that sounds good. Um, so we've kind of talked a little bit about um, the problem, you know, with the broadly um, with the incentive structures and, you know, what motivated you to go into these guidelines and, and why you felt they were important, um, but did want to spend a little bit time into the specifics um, on the guidelines and how they supported open science and, and, and the behaviors that they were designed to encourage, um, just to give more um, meat on the bones of what the guidelines were. Um, so if you would mind speaking a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't want to emphasize the word support here because I think that's the right term. Uh, I'll come back to this later uh, when I give you some tips. Uh, we avoided mandates. Uh, I did not want to go down the uh, road of saying there is one way and only one way that you must do your science, but rather what I wanted to do was make it possible um, and, and to reward those people who were going to do it by recognizing uh, the workload that comes with doing open science. So, um, just out of the gate, uh, I was opposed, and no one actually proposed. Oh, well, probably not surprised there, but no one proposed a mandate on uh, on on open science. So we didn't want people to to really feel trapped or in a corner, but rather we just wanted to support those people. Um, so the the question here, I think, is really uh, what's the swath of behaviors we wanted to support? And so uh, this isn't just about did you publish in an open access journal. There, there's some problems with the open access models and APC charges, some things that are, I think, uh, 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 publishers are going to end up probably manipulating for, for economic gain. Uh, so it's not just about making your scholarship ac accessible, but really making the underlying work products accessible. Uh, for those of you who, who uh, most of you probably are in tune with what's going on with the National Academies Aligning Incentive Initiative and Helios, um, uh, if not, you just, you know, you can go to, I think it's heliosopen.org and you can, you can, uh, uh, look at that whole initiative and what's going on there. Um, uh, about the time we were working on some of these, these guidelines, uh, the National Academies was organizing an aligning incentives, uh, workshop. And I had the pleasure of working with a few people early on in this, um, uh, uh and early on in that process, they were developing some template models for, uh, evaluative products, you know, things that are part of the open science work product model that lies behind all the research, but typically isn't made public. Uh, so things like uh, the data 
the underlying data, the metadata, uh, analysis code, uh, and statistical procedures. Um, uh, with the work of, of the uh, uh, Center for Open Science, you know, pre-registration plans, registered reports, you know, all these things we wanted to be able to document and to be able to capture as part of, of the work product that people were, were doing, right? Recognizing that a paper is just the words on a sheet, but there is all the work that goes into preparing that. And that we wanted to be able to capture the swath of work and recognize those work products um, to the extent possible um, uh, through our evaluative process. And so in our, both in our annual review, but also in our promotion tenure documents, we do now actually ask people to provide pretty extensive annotations of a set of publications so that we can look at, you know, data sets. We can look at accessibility of, of, uh, of data. We can look at accessibility of analysis code codes, um, efforts they might've engaged in to ensure reproducibility in one form or another, and really giving people an opportunity to say more about the research that goes into a CV line than what you get out of a CV line, right? So uh, it's a pretty nice little extension on a, on, a, on a CV that just allows people to um, advocate for themselves, but just describe the scholarship in a little bit more detail along a set of dimensions that capture open science, but other things too. Um, actually, I lost track of the question I was trying to answer. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, so, you were perfectly in line. You were perfectly in line talking about the behaviors that guidelines were, were trying to encourage. Yeah, um, that, that, that might be most of them, you know, making the scholarship uh, accessible. Um, you know, I, here's a place where I can talk about leadership, campus leadership. I'm fortunate to work at a university where um, my leaders recognize and value the importance of open science. At the time we started working on this, uh, we had a new VPR who had just come over from uh, NIST, and it turns out that she was a proponent of open science. Um, and my dean at the time was uh, 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 a psychologist by training and you know fully aware of all the stuff that was going on in psychology, the reproducibility crisis, uh, the need for really thinking about, um, you know, open science and and uh, uh, he gave me the the latitude uh, to to work on this project and the encouragement. My associate dean uh, put me in touch with uh, the provost office. Turns out the provost office was like, you know what this is kind of an important issue. We're, we've been thinking about this from the perspective of responsible conduct of research. And so it turned out that campus leadership was uh, mostly on board. Um, well actually I, I shouldn't say mostly they 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 recognized the importance and they endorsed it. Um, and they allowed us to move through, move forward. Uh, Maryland may not be the same as other institutions because here at Maryland, units determine what the guidelines are, and uh, uh, you know the, the upper level administration sort of looks to the units to tell them what we should be evaluating in, in our field, and and so we have a little bit of latitude due to that too. Um, so, you know, th these issues, though, were, were already bubbling up on campus uh, at that time. Very good. All right, moving right along. Let's look here at some of the next questions we have. But um, um, a just big, broad question. You've already uh, factored a lot of this in um, with the leadership. Um, but what, what factors supported the adoption of the guidelines and which factors opposed them? Um, you know, so this is this is an interesting question because you know when I first started getting into this process, uh, my first approach was to take our existing guidelines and start to tinker with them, and uh, you know trying to infuse some open science process. And mostly, I got some looks at me like, you know, what are we doing? Like, what's you know what why you know why would the and they they're like, okay, yeah, we could probably do this. But at the end of the day, what I realized early on in that process was that we weren't really going to make progress if we took our current standard and try to change it, that really we needed a fresh start. Um, and so through a variety of, of, of uh, external factors, including this thing called a pandemic, uh, I was able to put that on hold and uh, restart it sometime later. And I restarted it with a completely different approach, recognizing that we weren't going to be able to simply uh, tinker with the existing criteria that really we need to do a complete rethinking of what our criteria were. Otherwise, they were just going to be really bad and incomplete, 
but have the word open science in it. Um, and that just wasn't enough for me. We really need to have clearer guidelines that uh, 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 provided clear guidance to our faculty and clear guidance to our external reviewers. Um, so, you know, there, there were, by the time we got to the point where we were voting on it, uh, people had bought in. And I kind of realized this when we were in one of our faculty meetings and we were literally going line by line what do you think of this sentence? What do you think of that sentence? Um, and uh, the people who were jumping into the conversation were the people who I thought, if anybody's going to really object loudly, it's going to be, you know, some of these individuals. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't like that. By the time we got to that point, I think people had seen and recognized the importance of what we're doing and had bought in. Um, and saw the value. And so, you know, kudos to my faculty, really, quite frankly, for, for being so collaborative on it. Um, so, you know, I think one of the questions that came up in this process, you know, it's a factor opposed, and, and this is sort of reading the tea leaves, is, you know, the read of some of my faculty, uh, my read of some of my faculty was, well, what are other people doing? So the constant questions were, are we allowed to? What does faculty affairs say about this? What what are the what you know what are they saying in the provost office? Is this no, are we allowed to do these things? And uh, are you know what else? What what about other people in the field? Is, are we going to be the only ones? And I'm like, you know what? Someone's got to be first, and I would rather not be last. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, and you know, for me, it was a matter of these changes are coming. And we need to be out front of that wave, or we can be trying to, you know, save ourselves at the end. And uh, I felt that it was really important for us to be deliberative, where we could take some time to do this right, uh, think through the, the process, and make things happen now, as opposed to waiting until everybody else did it. Or no one does it, even worse, right? Uh, and we find ourselves not made any, having made any uh, progress on this. Um, but you know, one of one of those sort of undertones was, you know, what are other people doing? Uh, you know, is this possible? Can we do it? And ultimately, I came back to that something Marcy you said early on is, you know, we do it because it's right, the right thing to do, right? Sometimes you say, you know what, this is the right thing to do, and we should do it. For that reason and that reason alone and and we return to that sort of general theme time and time again throughout our discussions what is the right thing to do the right thing to do is not to keep our stuff locked up behind the fire a paywall or to keep our work uh siloed and uh private the right thing to do is to share our work as broadly as possible now i'll just give you a, a little anecdote that i learned from my librarians uh and that is, uh, you know, when you have a publishing deal, you set up with a uh, uh, journal or or with a journal company like Elsevier or whatever. Uh, there's usually wording in there that the research, like the the articles or the the products, can be shared publicly. Uh, but the definition of shared publicly is anybody is allowed to come into the library at the University of Maryland to access that material, which is just the most ridiculous form of public access that you can even imagine, because it's not public access. It's public access for those who feel comfortable coming onto the college campus, which means you also have to have some transportation to come to the university. You have to have uh, sort of the willingness to come onto a campus full of people who are unlike you. And when you start think about, thinking about it in terms of access to real, you know, real people's access to that material, you start to realize just how messed up the system is. And the formative access versus real access. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. yeah, and if you really, if you really endorse these views of equity, uh, of inclusion, then there's really no other way to think about it than really breaking down those walls that have prevented us from sharing our material. You know, that resonated with people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I I have good faculty in my in, in my department who's, um, you know, they they know what the right thing to do is, and they were able to do it. So, yeah, that does resonate. It hit, hits home, and it's a strong, powerful message. And um, you know, if you have 
you know, doing the right thing is your North star. Um, you know, I think that's a strong motivating factor. Um, so that's wonderful. And I was really in, um, inspired to hear even down to the detailed line about feedback um, from the faculty as you were going. They were getting into the, the specifics um, to make sure that they were comfortable and, and fully understood. So, you know, I'm a biased party, but I'm, I'm sold and I'm bought in. You've, you've, you've convinced me, that's, that's for sure. Um, but next kind of transition, I'm kind of interesting. Yeah, you made all of these arguments. Now they've slowly been adopted, adopted and, and implemented. Um, what has been the reaction since, um, you know, as they went into effect? What have you seen? Well, first of all, let me just say that they've only been in effect for a few months. <laughs> so, uh, and and quite honestly, there, there's a grace period here. I mean, people are allowed to uh, 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 be uh, grandfathered in uh, to the old um, policies. So we have those legacy policies that are still there. And if someone doesn't feel comfortable going up under the new policies, then that's fine. Uh, uh, but eventually people will be going through these new policies as they're, they're specified. Um, so that the grandfathering sort of protects people who feel like they were, they aren't consistent with the way they've been doing science for the last five, seven years or whatever. Um, so the reaction. So um, a few things. One is uh, one of my senior colleagues commented to me uh, uh, sort of offhand that, oh, so you mean what we just adopted is progressive. And, and I'm like, Wait, I, yeah, yeah, like this is the way we should be doing it. This is what people really aspire to do. But yeah, we're, you know, we, we've just adopted a, what I would call a pretty aggressive, a progressive uh, policy. And his response was cool. Um, uh, another one. Uh, Strong support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I, I've had one or, you know, a small number of other faculty who have uh, reached out. Uh, subsequent to our adoption of those policies and just thanked me for really pushing it and saying that it was just, in their view, a really important uh, step for our department, but also for the field. And uh, so, you know, I think there's some acknowledgement that, that this is the way we should be doing it and probably the way we should have been doing it for a long time. And uh, thanked me for, for making it happen. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's, it's, the community that makes it happen, not not one person. So we're still, you know, feeling our way through these things. So I don't have a lot of reaction, but you know, generally positive. You know, there, there were no nobody objected to the policies. It was a purely anonymous vote, and no one voted to to uh, oppose the policies. So that says something, I guess. It says a lot. Yeah. Um, returning to some of the audience questions, um, this kind of follows. Um, what about the practices now that you're building support and, and hope, hopefully to see that mushroom? Um, what about other departments in, in the institution? Have you seen this pop up anywhere else? Um, not as much as I was hoping. Um, I know that there are other advocates on campus uh, who, who are pushing for change. Um, you know, and, and it's, you know, there's a lot of variation across fields, unfortunately, in sort of where people stand, or at least their knowledge of what open science is and what it means. And even open access, right, I think is commonly misunderstood as you got to publish in an open access journal that you pay an open access fee for. Well, no, uh, there's other forms of open access. And, you know, part of this is really about educating uh, people and making sure people are making sure people are aware. So unfortunately, you know, right now, um, there hasn't been as much uptake uh, on this at our campus level, not as much as I had hoped. We also had some untimely turnover in our uh, administration that sort of you know, kind of go back to the well and start, um, you know, talking with new administrators about, uh, you know, what we're doing and whatnot. I will say that uh, the camp, our campus just happens to be going through a campus-wide process uh, in the next couple of years for uh, re-envisioning uh, tenure and promotion criteria. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like for sure. Uh, I suspect there will be elements of open science. I don't know if they'll be fully endorsed like we are in our department, but I think that will be part of it. But it is, it is a priority on our campus generally. Uh, how it will manifest, I'm not sure. Great, great. Um, another great question too um, about um, the 
the point of, of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, with these guidelines, um, you know, kind of looking at the evidence base for that. Um, have you seen anything or read anything about adopting these processes that would improve um, DEI in the academy? Um, and do you see, can see a conceivable pathway that you would envision it would? You've already spoken to that a little bit, but um, about yeah, it. yeah. I, th so this is really an important question. When we talk about my, I'll come to my tips here at the end about you know how to sort of think about framing and uh, really broadening the conception of what our revision was about was, you know, not thinking about it as open science per se, but really thinking about it from the perspective of, of inclusion, uh, diversity, and equity. Um, and so many of the things that we ended up putting into our policy, uh, you know, it wasn't just about making our science more open and transparent. It was about broadening our definition of inclusion. Open science is one piece of that. Um, but our criteria were very intentionally designed uh, to try to eliminate barriers, to uh, eliminate biases that may pop up, and to start respecting uh, to a much greater degree that there are, you know, a lot of young researchers who are coming into the field who they want to do good and they want to do good in particular communities or with particular communities. And so, we made a point of really building our criteria around making that possible, making it, it rewarding and or rewarded and uh, making it recognized. And so it's all part of the policy uh, so that, you know, in an ideal world, right, those po our policy sort of comprehensively addresses that set of issues. Open science being one thing, but the other part of it being really thinking about who is it that we study? Who's invited into the research endeavor? Uh, what are the challenges that individual people have in the conduct of their work as they wish to do? And then really writing the criteria in a way that uh, enables them to do that and to recognize those challenges and barriers. Yeah, absolutely. Moving forward, um, going through, see um, the, um, the next question before we, we run low on time here. Um, but what about tips you might have for people or departments who are looking to move in this direction? Um, so that's a, the, the key question. Yeah, okay, so I have um, uh, seven tips. All right, so bear with me. Um, uh, tip number one, I'll, I'll elaborate on these just a little bit. Tip number one is identify your leverage points. I'll come back to that. Uh, tip number two is uh, engage your higher administrators where possible. Uh, number three is, is think broadly about change in your P&T criteria, again, not just about open science. Uh, tip number four, which really should be number one, which is identify your core values because everything should be framed around that set of core values. That may differ from one unit to another unit, may differ from one discipline to another discipline, but you really, I think, if you can frame up those core values, it's really, really important. Tip number five is uh, dig up the data, find the data, uh, do the work to find the consensus documents that you can use to provide your arguments to your faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, tip number six is be prepared to compromise. And then uh, tip number seven is avoid mandates. So let me just return to number one, um, identify your leverage points. Uh, so you, you really need to figure out what's possible uh, in your department or at your universities. Different universities work different ways. And so what we were able to do here may not actually be very easy to do elsewhere. Uh, we controlled our own de destiny, and I was able to work within my faculty to make it happen. Uh, and uh, so my leverage points were uh, my faculty and trying to figure out how I can herd them into the right direction uh, to make this work. Uh, so you really need to know where at the university, who you need to leverage to make it happen. And uh, also having advocates in your corner. So when I was able to go to my dean or my associate dean or the vice provost and say, hey, we're doing this, is there a problem? And they could say, no, this is great. We look to the units to do this, move ahead. I could go back to my unit and say, we have approval to do this. I've checked it three times and we can do these things. Um, number two related to that is the uh, engage your higher administrators. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Helios, uh, look it up. A lot of institutions have sort of signed on to the Helios uh, project. So there's a lot of stuff going on at the higher administrator level. One thing that I was really struck by in some of these groups is that 
uh, actually literally floored that deans and provosts are looking to the faculty to do stuff. And simultaneously, the faculty are looking for guidance from the higher administrators. And so we're sort of at this impasse of who's going to tell us what to do first. I mean, who goes first? Yeah, right. Um, by the way, there's also another uh, project going on through the Council of Graduate Studies and the uh, Association for Education Research, or the uh, AERA, so CGS and AERA is also has another project going on. But many of the deans and provosts and campus leadership are involved in these efforts. And so there's things going on out there that many of you may or may not have uh, any knowledge of. Uh, my third point was think broadly about change. Uh, I brought this up earlier. You know, what are we trying to do with, with open science? We're really trying to build a more inclusive science and a more accessible science. And uh, the principles of, of accessibility and inclusion can manifest in a whole bunch of different ways. And so I encourage you to think broadly about what sort of changes you can make. Um, the more broad you think, the more people you can bring into the fold, right? So people want to see accessibility and inclusion addressed in a way that is meaningful to them. Open science may not be the part that's, that's meaningful to them. That's okay. But there may be other things that you could do that would be very meaningful. And so you can bring more people into the fold, I think, by really broadening our definition. Um, I won't say much more, more about core values other than look to your university's mission statement and see what they say there. If you have a departmental mission state, statement, even better. Uh, use data. Uh, there's a lot of work out there uh, that's available on uh, uh, shoddy indicators <laughs> of research evaluation. Uh, have your faculty read the DORA statement, uh, sfdora.org. Uh, I did this early on. I bribed them with ice cream. Uh, get them to, to read the, the statement so that they see that there is a community of scientists out there that are saying, don't use these summary journal indicators so much, right? Back off those and think about reading the substance. Uh, compromise is important. You know, you're not going to be able to fix everything, but if you can move the needle, that's, that's probably good. Um, and then I just said earlier, remove, uh, avoid mandates. Um, so engage people, energize them, uh, make it so it's possible and it's rewarded and cross your fingers that it actually happens. <laughs> have, to have trust in your people and inspire them. Yeah. I think that's really it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. All right. We have a couple more minutes left, but definitely um, this is a fun question wanted to get into um, as well. But um, what's one thing you wish you knew before you launched this endeavor? If you had to go back in time and, and tell yourself. I'll share two things. Uh, they, these, these contradict each other. So bear with me. Uh, first, I wish I had a better sense of people's understanding of open science uh, and why it is necessary. So I, I, you know, kind of overestimated how much people were paying attention to what was going on in the field. I happen to be in my little bubble, reading a lot of work coming out of, uh, you know, Brian Nozick's lab and other people's lab and, and thinking, oh my God, we got to do something about this. But I learned that actually that was me, but not a lot of other people. And so there was a period of time when I felt, okay, I got to go back and I have to sort of start sharing out some things. And so I did this slow bleed of information sharing to get people sort of acquiesced to the state of affairs and why we are doing it. And then the other thing sort of contradicting this uh, perspective is just how okay people were with change and prepared and a number of people wanting it, uh, but never spoke of it. And so, uh, so I wish I knew that there were a lot more people who were ready uh, to engage in these activities and welcome them. So much to my delight, I had a number of colleagues who were very explicit in their support early on and recognized the need to, to change. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, we had another, and I did not realize this, this is interesting, a, a great question um, um, from an attendee member that says, um, in a Canadian court case, student evaluations of teaching were prohibited from p and decisions at one university because of inherent bias, sex, age, appearance, et cetera, um, has there been any history of public complaints that existing, the existing PNT policies um, using things like the citation metrics that we discussed are, were also biased and unjust? Um, yeah. 
Not that I know of. Um, I didn't find anything on this, but I will say that in my reading of this literature, to me, it's it's a uh, it's a, it's an easy target because there is enough research now that shows that uh, there are inherent biases. Um, so I haven't heard of anything. I wouldn't be surprised if we see something sooner or later. Coming. Right. One final question, and I know we are down to our final three minutes, um, but any quick summaries or um, input you would have for um, things that other departments, um, things departments can do to support open science? Yeah, okay, so uh, what other things can you do to support open science? You know, the p and policies are really, really important, uh, but I do think that there has to be a very consistent message and consistent set of actions that a department does uh, uh, to support these activities. It can't just all be about mandates or promotion and tenure policies. Uh, we include, you know, things that I've done in my department, I include, uh, or we include um, mention of open science in our job applications or our job ads. Uh, so that people know that it's coming, that this is something that we value and it is important. Um, I created a, a funding initiative uh, and put a couple hundred thousand dollars behind it in our own department to support what I call broadening participation. Uh, so it's an initiative that we started here to really broaden participation in science. It includes open science. It's not solely a focus on open science, but it also includes things like open education resources. Uh, so we provide funding for faculty to create free and accessible education resources, to create uh, open science pipelines, to uh, engage in other activities that might broaden representation in science in various ways. Um, so that was really important. I also include in startup uh, a, a funding line for open access publishing. Uh, so that's a clear sync signal, both with, uh, you know, here's what we value, but also with the money to back it up to say, we want you to make your work accessible and we find it important. And so that's required in all of my startup packages in my own department. Great. Sounds fantastic. Um, we are running, we are at 2.59. Um, I did want to take a moment um, before we leave to um, um, provide a sign-up form um, for those looking to follow up. Um, from this discussion, if you're interested in um, collaborating, looking forward um, to how you may um, um, be in, in, in greater contact, um, do you like to say something about that, Mike? You yeah, yeah, so- uh, Very um, generous about this, so I just want everyone to know how generous <laughs> you're being. Yeah, so no, uh, um, I'm happy to work with anybody, any departments, any, any individual who wants to uh, uh, institute change. Um, so if you sign up on that form, give me your email, um, and, uh, I'll try to organize some working groups, uh, for those of you who are interested in doing this and, and maybe sort of help guide you through this process with my lessons learned. I'm happy to work with whoever, uh, signs up, whatever your unit is or whatever your, uh, particular, uh, situation is. So, uh, go ahead, sign in, log in, whatever, enter your email and tell me a little bit about what you want. Thank you so much. The link is in the chat. Um, Michael, thank you. You have been a real thoughtful, thoughtful advocate for this. Um, appreciate all of your, the detailed effort that you, you've put into this um, and, and being a leader. Um, so just want to recognize you and say thank you and appreciate everything that you're doing to, to do, do this the right way. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you for your time today. Yeah, you're welcome and thank you. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us. We're at three o'clock on the dot. Um, so we will say good afternoon or goodbye and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you.